Ready? Go. <laughs> Down here in the studio today with my friend Bill Z. Good morning, Bill. Morning. And uh, if you've noticed, Bill is both old and ugly and an examiner. All three. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, I don't have much in my defense. You know, I've just been hanging around air airports a long time, and uh, you know, that's the way you get old and ugly, you know. Perfect. Well, we're going to talk through a couple of things. You and I have uh, had a chance to visit. We've known each other for a long time, and you're a... Uh, well, you're an Air Force guy. You flew a lot of business jets, and you've been an, uh, an examiner for 35 years. So give me some backstory on, on what your opinion is on stuff here. What what would you like to say? Well, first of all, I think people get confused about, you know, you mentioned ACS and PTS and all this kind of stuff. You go back to the Stone Age when I started flying, the examiners just had what they call a, a, a test guide. And basically the examiner did a test any way he wanted to and whatever he felt was important. So one examiner's test would be totally different from another where then they, and they uh, came out with the uh, practical test standards, which defined what the tasks were required and what the standards were and what was allowed and what wasn't. Whereas before that, it was pretty much whatever the examiner thought was important. And then uh, the newer versions, the ACS has come out. And what that does is it finds the requirements to get a qualification to do certain things. So, you know, just like when you look in the regulations, it defines how much time, experience, whatever training is required to get a be student pilot or private pilot or whatever. And you get into corporate jets and then you, uh, you know, you have certain things that you have to know about the systems. You have to know, to do certain maneuvers and they end up with a standard type ride, which includes different approaches and emergencies, all that kind of stuff. So that's what's required. And that's what defines uh, what the standards are for training to get a rating to be qualified to do something. But of course, you know, as we all know, we, everybody says it's a license to learn. And at that point, you're qualified, but you don't have a lot of experience. And then um, uh, up until the, I think sometime in the 70s, there was no requirement for any training after that. You could get your private pilot certificate and fly for 50 years and never see an instructor again. So they said, we need to do something along the lines of our current training. So they came out with this flight review thing. It's pretty loosely defined. It just requires one hour of flight and one hour of ground training. And it's totally up to the, uh, the instructor to defy, decide what that is. And uh, whether they use, whether they try to go out and do steep turns or whatever it is, uh, it's totally up to the instructor. I know when I do an initial instructor test, I always encourage them to think about what uh, kind of flying this individual does so that you can cover material that's relevant. It's going to help them improve a little bit because if every time they take a flight review, if they can just up their game just a little bit, you're helping the whole community and improving safety for this person and for the community in general. Right. So one of the things that's, that really doesn't apply is the ACS standard doesn't really fit in so much with the uh, testing requirement. It's not required that they meet ACS standards when they take a flight review. It's up to the instructor to decide that. And uh, the whole thing is uh, uh, there's a lot of other programs that go along with that, you know, like the FA Wings program. They have uh, training pro safety review programs. And that, that I always encourage instructors to get their, get their uh, students and uh, the people they do flight reviews for to get in, get them into recurrent training of some sort. They have the WINGS program where they have safety seminars and they have training events that they can use. In fact, if they do enough of that, they can, uh, they can qualify for their flight review just based on the WINGS activity. And uh, so that's, that, you know, that's something that they can really take advantage of. In fact, the instructors can renew their instructor certificate based on WINGS activity. Right. But it's all getting in this recurrent training thing. You know, in the corporate jet world, you have your initial training. And then I know when I did, you know, I do a type ride and I think, wow, I really figured this all out. And then I come back in six months or a year and do some recurrent training. And I think, wow, I really learned a lot in the last year. You know, I really didn't know it when I thought I did. So, you know, getting that experience and being exposed to real world situations is important uh, in the training, whole training process. So, uh, you know, one of the things to remember is that uh, there are a lot of things that happen in the in the real world of flying that you aren't going to be able to be exposed to in, in your initial training or type training or whatever it is. 
And one of the things that the uh, corporate world and airlines have gotten into is uh, instead of just doing a repetitive check write every six months or a year and going through the same plain vanilla things every time. I mean, we always used to say, you know, uh, you know, I've got to do You know, you knew the whole profile before you went in the simulator and uh, you knew exactly what was going to happen. You knew all the sim tricks they used to call them and uh, how to get through it. So what, uh, what they ended up doing, uh, and the FAA encourages people getting into advanced qualification programs rather than just recurrent training itself. And based on uh, ASAP reports, safety reports submitted by crew members, or FOCA data, which is data that is based on, uh, which is recorded from the, in the airplane itself, when they just see a trend of things happening like long landings or high, you know, you're 10 knots fast on final all the time, things like that. It's something they can put back into the training program so that the training includes uh, throwing those things at the crew members to help them learn from other people's mistakes and hopefully improve them themselves in the, in the whole thing. And if you relate that to general aviation, it's a matter of what happens in the general aviation world. I know you, Dan, have, have been doing a lot of research on safety, uh, safety reports, accident reports, and so on. And there's a lot of things that we should feed back into the training. So when you get to the flight review or any recurrent training, you know, flight, flight reviews every 24 months, which is very minimal. But, you know, every few months, it would be good for private pilots, commercial pilots, whatever, to get into a, a more re frequent recurrent program where they're exposed to various situations that they might not have thought about or maybe didn't run into themselves. And if they can... Uh, if the instructor can expose them to the situation before they run into it on their own, they're more likely to come out of it safely and, and do well. So, uh, you know, one of the things to keep in mind as a, as a private pilot is that when they're going out for a flight review, you know, they're the, they're the, the customer and it's up to them to find an instructor that will give them the training to improve their, their own skills and to, uh, you know, they should look at it as, a, as an opportunity to become a better pilot out of the whole thing. Right. And just repeating, hashing over the same old things that might been been the test standards that had to do with uh, what was required to get the rating really doesn't really help them that much. It's more what are the things that are causing the accidents that they really need to be thinking about as a rated, rated pilot so that they can learn more about, learn from the mistakes of others and hopefully not do the same thing themselves. Exactly. And, and what you've kind of touched on here is the whole history. Uh, and, and you saw it because you you came through, you've been an examiner for a long time, and then you flew at NetJets. NetJets became AQP. And we want to touch basically on the history or, or the backstory on what is AQP? What, what are those letters stand for? And can you differentiate between the maneuvers contained in the ACS and scenarios contained in AQP. Right. Well, one of the things that uh, I, you know, I haven't done the training, I've been retired for a few years, but, you know, in the, like I said, in the, you know, just the standard, we used to do 135 checks all the time. So every, what, six months, I think it was, we go in and the final event was you go out and you do your, you do your oral and then you go out and you do the same scenario. So you do, you know, you, you knew you were going to do the NDB four circle of three, one right at JFK at night, you know, that sort of thing, you know, it's going to be the same right. old thing. And it, all it did was just kind of rehash the same thing. And it really got to be, it wasn't really a great learning. It was a good review, but it wasn't really a learning event. Now there were situations, I don't remember specifics, but uh, one of the things was uh, misset altimeters or maybe bad altimeter data, for example. And I remember one time we were doing an approach someplace, I don't know where, at night, of course, in the weather, in the simulator, and the uh, they gave us bad altimeter data. And here we are flying along, and all of a sudden we get a jet was warning, and and so what do you, how do you react to it? Well, you know, you weren't thinking there's going to be a jet was warning. You're looking for a runway, right? Well, so the training is, if the jip was squawks at you, you better get the heck out of there. So yeah, better on it. Yeah. So that they throw that as you at, at as an unexpected circumstance. So uh, obviously there must have been a situation where where something like that occurred. So they threw that into the training. So things like that, uh, you know, are really helpful to uh, to be able to you know get people to think outside the box a little bit and and uh, hopefully avoid a problem. Absolutely. And what you've just illustrated here is the clear distinction between doing the same old, same old predicted ho-hum 
maneuvers where there is no surprise versus AQP maneuvers, both at 121 and 135 and even general aviation, have to do with the element of surprise or what you like to call the startle factor. How does the startle factor relate to a pilot? Like, like say you did get a jip whiz um, and you hadn't trained for this. Well, what's the proper response to jip whiz while shooting the approach? We're going to respond immediately and we're doing a go around and we're going nose up and gear up and we're getting out of here because that's what we were trained to do. So it reduces that amount of time. What what can you talk about ACS maneuvers relating to no surprise versus AQP scenarios laced up with surprise? Right. Well, you know, if, if you're just doing a maneuver, it's, you know, you kind of go from one maneuver to the next and you, it's all expected activities and so on. Uh, you know, one of the things that I do on, on practical tests is, uh, you know, the loss of power on takeoff scenario. Where, and and multi-engine, we have to do it anyway, pull an engine at 500 feet or 400 feet off the end of the runway and that sort of thing. And even though you're briefed all this stuff, it's sometimes people just have a mental block and they just freeze. I've seen that where in a multi-engine test, you pull one of the engines at 400 feet, which is where you're supposed to do it. And they just sit there and freeze and those doesn't, doesn't go down and they don't go through their cleanup procedures and get the drag reduced and feather the prop and all that sort of thing. They're just sitting there and it's headed, for, headed in a band direction real fast. Same thing in a single engine test. You know, I, I remember doing a commercial test with this fellow one time, and we talked about, he's very knowledgeable and everything, talked about, well, you know, the, we talked about the startle factor, we talked about loss of power on takeoff, we went over the ACS, where specifically in the risk management area, talks about the applicant shall consider these things in the risk area, which is loss of power on the, on the takeoff roll or in the takeoff climb or some wording to that effect. And we talk about all. I said, oh, yeah, 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 I know all about that. Well, <laughs> so one of the things I'll do sometimes is at, you know, one of the, after we've got most of the tests done, I'll, we're climbing out and I'll pull the throttle and don't say a thing. And sometimes you know, this one guy just froze. Here he is, a commercial applicant, did everything else okay. But, he, you know, initially he just froze and didn't react. And he's, oh, right. I never, I never thought of that. <laughs> you know, so here it is. If that had happened in a real situation, uh, and on the other hand, a lot of times what I'll see people do, different flight schools will have a, a laminated card that they'll have their students and their uh, pilots that are flying their airplanes pre-think what they're going to do. They say, all right, today we're taking off on this runway. And they write down with a marker on the card, if this is what I'm going to do, if I lose power here, if I lose power there, and I'm going to head to this field or whatever it is. So they're mentally preparing themselves. Right. Because you think about somebody who's got a private pilot certificate. They haven't done a flight review. It's been going on two years. And here they are, you know, every time they go out, they push the throttle in, everything's great, no problem. And then all of a sudden something happens and they mentally just don't accept it. And you go into brain freeze, you know, and they just, just don't react. And, it is. Uh, it's, so. it's, it's complete brain freeze. And, uh, and, and we know that to be true. Um, you were, uh, you spent a little bit of time as a captain at NetJets. Tell me about the NetJets adaptation of of aqp when when did that happen and why why did netjets go to aqp well they saw the benefit of uh you know providing that training rather than just repetitive 135 checks that we did all the time um so they they've been working on it with the faa uh, for a number of years i mean i started there in 01 and I think we just said the 135 checks for probably the next 10 years, I would guess. And then after that, they were finally able to get approval to do the uh, do the AQP uh, uh, type of evaluations. And then you know they're working themselves into uh, you know other advancements in the in the training uh, whole thing. So uh, I can't remember the term the uh, N and O program, I guess, or the regulations they operate under, whatever it is. Anyway, they. Right. Uh, you know, one of the things that they were able to do in the in the in the evaluation was to uh, include that uh, as part of the test or part of the training. Uh, and, it, you know, it was a it was an, a goal of the training department for years to work that in. And it finally they were able to get it approved through all the proper channels with the FAA. Exactly. And that's that's some really good backstory on on where where it came from, you know, 
CRM started at, at the airlines and everybody fought CRM initially and then everybody figured out it was a good idea. Eventually, CRM trickled down to GA. CRM is actually now in the check rides that you're conducting. They call it SRM. But CRM and SRM right. is is absolutely intertwined with every check ride from the private pilot on the, all the way up. And it's a good thing. I think we're at a phase where people are beginning to understand the AQP philosophy of what AQP scenario-based training and being prepared for the startle factor, which is going to occur. Um, there's no startle in a steep turn or an S turn across the road or a Shondell. You as an examiner are going to give the guy, say, give me a steep turn to the left whenever you're ready. There's no surprise or anything right. that's going to raise your heartbeat in that. However, a scenario involving right. an emergency in a crisis, that's going to increase heart rate, blood pressure, it's going to cause brain lock, and it will probably cause the student to either freeze, like you've illustrated, or do something wrong or some kind of an, an inaction. And that's the clear distinction that I'm trying to make here between right. AQP. Well, keep uh, in mind, this, the maneuvers in the ACS or PTS, those are all just maneuvers the FAA has determined to demonstrate a higher level of skill. So in a yeah, in a uh, in slow flight at a private pilot, you get a hundred foot altitude tolerance, for example. Commercial, it's fifty foot tolerance, and you know so. And uh, doing a Shondell or a Lazy Eight requires more complex coordination and planning and all these kind of things. So it, those are the things the FAA has decided are necessary to get qualified to do get a certain certificate. That's all that is. It has and nothing to do with any any training for recurrent training or anything like that. It's just strictly certification. And that's where that all comes from. Right. So the you know the whole thing is, you know, it's just the beginning at that point. You so you met, you've demonstrated certain skill levels and uh, but that's all it is. And you can you can do the best lazy eight in the world, but if you don't if you don't have training beyond that and do periodic recurrent training, you're not going to really build the skill set you need to keep yourself safe in the long run. So, and the, th the thing is, I encourage people to participate in the wings program, to go to safety seminars. I mean, all the four letter groups have various activities, webinars online, EAA, AOPA, all, all these different organizations have things that you can participate in. Don't cost you a dime. And you can learn a lot. Go to your in your area. I'm sure your FAST team has different seminars that they put on. I know I participate in the ones up in New York, and uh, you know, and different instructors present material. And the whole thing is, you learn a lot from each other by doing that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're a very qualified guy. You know, you've been you've been in all facets and aspects of it for a long time. A tremendous amount of credentials. Um, my idea is to uh, do a Zoom call with industry people like yourself on occasion, just to get your background and perspective. And in light of that, I'm, I think each time I do one of these Zoom calls, I'm going to ask each person at the conclusion of the Zoom call the same basic set of questions, kind of alterable uh, to the individual. But if it's okay with you, I'm going to yeah. I'm going to ask you a, a couple uh, questions here that. I'm probably just going to use the same question bank for everybody that I Zoom call with here. So my question, my first question for you is, um, you have firsthand experience with AQP and JETS. Tell me what the difference is between FAA maneuvers and AQP scenarios. Well, it's apples and oranges. It's total two do totally different uh, types of events. You know, one is, uh, you know, one is a uh, standards demonstration to get a, cer a certain qualification level, a certification level, and the other is training for the real world events that you're going to, you know, that you're going to see in the long term. Exactly. Uh, question number two, is it possible to adopt the AQP scenario philosophy commonly used in 135 and 121 to crew operators and apply it to little airplanes? Certainly. Yeah, no question. And, and that's what we've been talking about. You know, that's the thing that, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I, I uh, read here is somebody's talking about flight reviews and they say, you know, uh, you know, look at the flight review as an opportunity to become a better pilot. You're the consumer. You find an instructor is going to teach you the things that you think are important. And it, the first part of it is realizing it's important. It's not just checking a box and getting that flight review so you can continue to fly after 24 months. You know, you need to you need to improve yourself. You know, we should all be on the, on a road of continual upgrades, improvements, and so on on our skill levels. 
Exactly. Question number three. In your opinion, are today's GA pilots more commonly being killed by ACS maneuvers or by AQP scenarios? Well, it depends. <laughs> if you're talking ACS maneuver, one of the things you talk about is an engine failure. But if you do it, and and uh, you know, quite often, uh, a lot of times, uh, people will do an engine failure at cruise altitude or something. Well, what do you normally do there? Uh, you know, it's no big deal because planes already. Uh, trimmed so it's not going to stall it's your cr cruise speed so the only thing you got to do is raise the nose well gee think about that now you're in a takeoff scenario right. and your your habit pattern is to raise the nose so you know it's really a you know an apples and oranges thing because you really have to think about what your situation you're in and be and and you want to find an instructor that's going to show you those things yeah ex exactly um what is the startle startle factor that you often refer to when you and I talk? What is the startle factor, and how does AQP reduce its negative effect in little airplanes? Well, startle factor is just you know the fact that something unexpected should happen, and then you know they say you're you're I read saw this video maybe you did of a guy flying a P fifty one up in Canada and he had an engine surge problem. He ended up uh, uh, you know. It, it, you know, it's one of those things, experience guy, all kinds of warbird experience and airline experience. And here, this engine starts to run rough and, and he, and, and he tried to tried to make it to the airport. And he said, it, it, he reverted to his monkey brain. In other words, he was just doing work. His brain was just working at a very fundamental level. He wasn't thinking at the higher level, like he should have been. And the tower said, Hey, your gear's not down. Well, here he is on a wide uh, left downwind for the runway, he drops the landing gear. Well, P-51 landing gear's got a lot of drag in it. And of course, <laughs> you know, that caused him to have to do an off airport landing because he just reacted without thinking. Right. So you know, the startle factor is, you know, is something you can try to re prepare for as best you can. Uh, Pre-takeoff briefings, uh, work plans, whatever you want to call them are part of uh, hopefully avoiding that sort of thing. But again, we're all subject to it. I don't care who you are. We all, you know, we all revert back to that sort of thing. You, you're driving, driving out in the woods and all of a sudden a deer pulls out in front of your car. Well, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> not much at that point. You know, it's, if right. you're startled and you're, you're probably not going to react correctly. So just be right. aware that we're subject to that. Yeah. Practicing to mitigate the startle effect is really uh, what I think ACS or uh, AQP is all about. Is a flight review conducted once every two years on the basis of FAA maneuvers sufficient for the average GA pilot? Probably not. I mean, it's it's something you could do. And again, you, the pilot as the consumer needs to find an instructor that teaches them what they think is important. And if all they want to do is check the box and move on, which some people do, which uh, sometimes bad results, uh, then that, you know, they need to, it's just a matter of having the right attitude and trying to continually improve themselves. And they look for the guy that just kind of lets them, lets them, uh, you know, just go through and hey, we'll just, uh, we'll have some coffee and talk a little bit and then we'll go out and we'll fly, do a couple landings and we'll call it good. Well, that's not really going to do much for their own selves. And it's, you know, technically it meets the requirements and, uh, but really is it, is it really serving the purposes they should be expecting from their instructor? Exactly. Uh, my last question. Do you as an examiner endorse the concept of voluntary general aviation AQP additional scenario based training for GA little airplane pilots? Sure. I mean, it's all airplanes and airplane, whether you're flying a 777 like you used to or flying a 150, it's all the same thing. And and things happen and you need to prepare yourself. So the more realistic uh, situations you have in your training, the more re more likely it is you're going to react correctly should it happen in the real world. Exactly. Perfect. Well, anything else that you want to add that we haven't that we haven't covered? I thought I thought you did a really nice job of giving us the backstory on AQP and where it where it came from. And um, I think you and I are on the same page, uh, especially when when we want to reiterate that AQP it's not necessary to have FOQA data or certification or FAA approval, we can still learn about these scenarios and beef ourselves up voluntarily uh, on, on our own. 
Right. Oh, absolutely. One of the things we got to remember, I mean, we've got a lot of egos in this business. You, I, I know you don't have one, Dan, but there's a lot of folks that do. And, you know, every every organization, all the all letter groups and everybody, you got your you got your stars and you got the people that are trying to lead the group. But we got to remember, we're all in the same team. We're all there to improve the safety of flying in general. And we want to have a good, successful, uh, 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 you know, flying environment. And And we only do that by maintaining our skills and by keeping ourselves safe. So that's the whole thing is to make sure that we remember, uh, you know, use the resources. There's a lot of them out there and, you know, none of them are perfect, but they're all good. And, uh, you know, sitting on a webinar on a, you know, off airport landings or whatever it may be, those are all good things. And we all continue to learn from that. Yeah. And, you know, I think the, uh, what I've learned is the, the the power of the internet. Now that we have Instagram and Facebook and, and YouTube, there's more people besides me willing to talk about accidents and what probably happened, what's the probable cause, and can we learn off of this guy's accident more in real time to kind of go back and say, well, here's here's what he did, and he probably like the Venice thing rotated right up into the black and he wasn't ready for that. And he was surprised and he drove it right straight in the water. And we can learn about that right, right. Within, a, within a week after the accident. This one's pretty clear cut what he did. Yeah. We don't need to wait three years to figure out that's what this guy did wrong. Yeah. I know there's a fellow that uh, he, you know, he was a single pilot flying a CJ or something like that, small jet. And uh, you know, he took his family up to uh, up to uh, Cleveland to watch a ball game or something. Yeah. Took off from Lakefront Airport at nighttime, and they usually have you turn out over the lake there. And guess what? Nighttime over the lake, no horizon. Boom. Yeah, yeah, he did the exact same thing. It's 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 the same maneuver over and over again. But um, I guess my my main conclusion, Bill, I, I appreciate your time, and uh, you're definitely a well qualified veteran in the industry. Uh, I think people appreciate hearing uh, your words on this subject. We're all human beings, and uh, as long as we're on uh, this side of the planet and still vertical, our objective is is staying alive. We got a pilot's license that allows us to fly that gave us the initial training uh, to become a pilot. Now the question is, what can we do to stay alive after we have a pilot's license? And that's where the AQP philosophy is important, teaching people that there are scenarios that are going to happen to them as a surprise, these things are definitely going to happen to them, and we want them to know what those possible scenarios are so that they can be more ready. Right. Absolutely. Yep. I agree. Sounds good. Well, Bill, I want you to have a great day, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again. Um, and uh, we will, uh, I'm sure we will enter into another. Uh, scenario that involves barbecue and airplanes and something <laughs> great there. again sounds like sounds like a plan <laughs> yes sir right. take thank care you. have a good day yes sir bill thank you oh, bye